So within the wider business environment, you have discussed a number of things so far, isn't it? I'm sure you'd say that, yes, we've discussed a number of items. We've just finished uh, discussing the issue of the issues of uh, the challenges of uh, the physical environment and the response in terms of environmental management accounting. But there's yet something else we want to discuss about the environment. We want to talk about risk and uncertainty. This is another variable within the environment. And the examiner wants you to clearly tell us the impact of risk and uncertainty. And also, how to carry out the risk assessment. So how do we carry out a risk assessment or how do we bring in risk into our decision-making? Let's go. The word risk involves events which may or may not occur, but whose forbid of occurrence can be calculated. Statistical, and their likelihood of their occurrence predicted for the past records. Now, this is related to the concept of objectives. Eh? Yeah, because an organization, we have an objective. Now we are saying that uh, there's a chance that we may not meet those of the objective. We may not meet our goal or our mark. So the possibility that we may not meet our objective, and if we, are, we can even calculate the probabilities, we can even assign probabilities because you have enough experience and you've got enough observations. We are saying then we are dealing with concept called risk. If an event is uncertain, we're talking about those events whose outcome cannot be predicted with statistical confidence. So we can't predict this. We can assign probabilities. Why? We are not very sure about the input output relationship. We're not very sure about that. We don't have uh, enough experience. So such events are described as uncertain. What are the sources of risk? So part of uh, risk management is identifying sources of risk. Where could risk come from? We have the, we have the macro environment. And the macro environment can be studied by looking at these six aspects. The political environment, the economic environment, the social environment, the technological environment, the physical environment, and the legal environment. So these are what we can study. These are what we can study to come up with sources of risk. So 
So risks for your organization can come from any of these. In the wider environment, what you call the macro or the wider environment. As we discussed earlier on, risks also, also could come from your industry. And the five forces model which we have discussed can help us identify the possible sources of risk for a given industry. Now, Remember, anything that we look at in this course, we need to come back to the concept of performance. The concept of performance. Management. So the question is, what's the relationship then between risk and performance management? Okay, somebody says, let's show this again. Somebody says they wanted to see this slide again. The macro environment, we'll use the pastel and the micro environments. Somebody wanted to Check that. Okay, is that all right? Okay. I'll will, I will throw this presentation on our forum. I'll throw the slides on our forum. What's the link between uh, risk and performance management? An organization may fail to achieve its objectives due to risk or uncertain factors arising from its environment, the wider environment or from the industry environment. So those objectives that you want to achieve, we may not achieve them. The reason? Well, because of risk. Or uncertainty. So then uh, in decision making, when we teach students risk and uncertainty, we normally address the question, how do you incorporate risk and uncertainty in decision making? How do you incorporate risk and uncertainty in decision making? So you must be able to explain how this is done. I'll give you an example, for instance, in NPVA, Analysis. We normally say, how do you incorporate risk and uncertainty? We talk about the adjusted discount rate as a method that we can use. Do you remember that? Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. You can also say we can use the concept of sensitivity analysis. Adjusted discount rate, yeah? Adjusted discount rate, somebody wanted that. Uh, 
adjusted discount rate. We can adjust the discount rate. We can use sensitivity analysis. Or we can use expected values. So if somebody asks you a question, it says, you have done an NPV, can you tell me, how did you incorporate risk and uncertainty? You must be able to tell them that, oh, look, I've used sensitivity analysis, I adjusted the discount rate, or I use the expected values. That's what we mean by this point. You need to identify a method of incorporating risk and uncertainty in decision making. You must tell us what method you have used. Sometimes in risk and uncertainty, certain aspects can be confusing. There may be so many inputs and outputs. We may have a range of inputs and outputs. In each case, we need a good presentation method to demonstrate them or to show them, display them. You need a good presentation method. Or you need a good analysis method. The one which is quite common on our exam is this one. The attitude towards risk and the decision-making criterion, this one. What criteria are you going to use for a given risk appetite? For a given risk appetite, what criteria are you going to use? Now this one is uh, examined quite often. Deciding on which option to go for when there's risk and uncertainty. And that's what we'll be doing shortly. So how can we incorporate uh, risk and uncertainty in decision making? The answer is, you can say, I can use probability, where I can actually express a probability of an occurrence. Where you can express a probability of an occurrence. Mm -hmm. what are the chances that a particular outcome is going to materialize? You can express a bit of an occurrence. We can use expected values, and this one is very common for your paper. We can do a sensitivity analysis, we can also do a simulation. Or we can use a standard deviation, calculate a standard deviation or a particular variable. What of presentation? In terms of presentation, we can use a payoff table. We can use a decision tree. We can do a full probability distribution showing all the possible outcomes. So these are methods that we can use to present, to present or to analyze a scenario which has got risk and uncertainty embedded in it. Let's come to risk preferences or risk attitudes or risk appetites. We've got those who are risk seekers, we've got those who are risk averse, we've got those who are risk neutral. So who is a risk seeker? 
Well, we're talking about decision makers who are optimistic. These are optimistic decision makers who are interested in the best outcomes, no matter how small the chance is. Receive the advice that people are pessimistic, basically. These are people weak on the assumption that the worst outcome will occur. Risk neutral. We are talking about a decision maker who is concerned with the most likely. What is the most likely outcome? Or he wants to go for an average outcome. So these are risk preferences, risk attitudes, or risk appetites. And we have seen these, appetite, these uh, attitudes on your paper. So when you come across risk, your action or your route mainly will be determined by your risk preference or attitude. So therefore, in terms of criteria, you've got four possibilities. Number one, max mean. Max mean standing for maximize the minimum achievable profits. This one is used by people risk averse. We want to maximize on the minimum outcomes. Where do we get the best out of the minimum? Those who are risk seekers, they are here. They use a rule which is called what? Maximize the maximum achievable profits. These are people who are optimistic and they normally start from the best. Why are the best results? and they choose the highest out of the best results. Expected values, those are risk neutral. Use it. And they go for the most likely outcome. Minimax regret rule, minimize the regret from making a wrong decision. This is a form of risk evasion. A form of risk evasion. So it's those people who are risk averse, who are going to accept this type of an approach. Minimizing on the maximum regret. Minimize on the maximum regret. We'll come back to that later. Let us do an exercise. Let us do an exercise. We're going to do an exercise now. I want to illustrate those rules. Okay. I want to illustrate those rules. I hope you cannot see my figures on a spreadsheet. So let's go. Let's try these rules. Let's try these rules now. Okay. So 
So we've got D, E, and F. And you've got uh, number one, number two, and number three. Hundred, eighty, sixty. 85, 120, 90, Let's go. Let's do our analysis now. So let's start with the, <clears throat> the decision maker who is optimistic. Such a decision maker is going to use max max rule. That's what he's going to use, max max rule. So his approach is, what's the maximum here? What's the maximum here? That is the approach. So the maximum there is, the maximum there is, the maximum there is 85. So these are the maximum outcomes. So where do we get the best out of this? Where do we get the best out of this? E. So if you use the max max criteria, that's what you're going to do. He has got the highest result. So a person who is an optimistic or risk taker, that's what they'll use. What of uh, Those who are pessimistic, those who go by what's the worst? What's the worst? So these are the minimum results. These are the minimum results. Out of these minimum or terrible results, where do we get the best? Where do we get the best? This is the one that use the max mean. Somebody has said it's F. You're right. What of uh, those who go for an average or most likely? Most likely are the ones who use expected values, the EVs. So those who need probabilities, where are the probabilities? The probabilities are given here. 0 0.1, 0 0.6, and 0 
So you go, you say, point one, point six, point three. These are the probabilities. These are the probabilities. What are the EVs? We calculate the EVs now for D, for E, and for F. So multiply, we take that, multiply by back, okay? That's what we get. So let's go. Again here, we take batch, multiply by batch. We take a batch, multiply by batch. So these are the values that we have calculated. These are called expected values. These are called expected values. We add these up. We add these up. So which one has got the highest expected value? Which one has got the highest expected value? E. It's important for me to differentiate this because after the second world war, how Russia and Germany had to get an important so if we go by the expected value, we are going to choose that one. That's the highest that we have. That's what we'll go for. So far we have seen three rules, eh? We can use the max, max, max mean, or expected values. And we have seen that, that the choice depends on which criteria of use, isn't it? Let's look at the last one. The last one is called um, regret rule. And you're going to draw up a regret table. You're going to draw up a regret table. So let's draw up a regret table. And after drawing up a regret table, then we'll be able to see which one we are going to go for. So we go. We just need uh, the headings to draw up our own regret table. And also we need uh, these outcomes here. We need the outcomes here. So ask the question. Here is my question. Here is my question. If the condition one materializes or crystallizes, where do we get the best out of all these? The best is here. So if you chose D, you would not regret because you have the best result. But if you chose E, you regret because you are down 100 minus 80, 100 minus 60. So in terms of the regret table, then you can complete that line and say, here there's no regret. There we regret because we are down by 20, 100 minus 80. And there we are down by 40. 
So that is our first line. That is our first line. If you haven't followed me, let's put the second one together. In the second one, which one would you go for? The best result is only E. This is the best result. So if you choose E, there's no regret. They are done by 30. They are done by 35. So let's, let's include that. There, we are down 120 minus 90. There, there's no regret. There, you're down by 35. What over here? What's the best? 85. So there, there's no regret. There, we're down by 75. And here, we are down by 85 minus minus 20, or giving us 105. So these are the levels of regret that we carry. These are the levels of regret. What do we call this? We call this we call this a regret table. That's our regret table. The rule is called minimizing on the maximum regrets. So you come here, you say, what are the maximum regrets? The maximum there is 105. Where are we getting it from? We are looking at these here. What's the maximum here? What's the maximum there? What's the maximum there? Here, 25. And there, 40. So the rule is minimax, eh? Minimax, minimizing on the maximum regrets. Minimizing on the maximum regrets. So where do you find the lowest regret of these three? One where of the lowest regret. Where is our lowest regret, level of regret? Yes. The lowest regret is on F. That's the lowest regret. That's the lowest regret. So depending on uh, the criteria that we have chosen, we can see which project would go for. So this is uh, an illustration of how to apply the concept that we've just covered. Back to our notes. So this is what uh, was meant here by the use of max, max, mini max, mm, max min, or mini max regret, and also expected values. These are the risk analysis techniques which the syllabus was talking about. A further question is one which is on September, December, 2017, question number four. 
where these uh, risk analysis techniques were examined. Then on those notes, there's something that I would love to talk about. What is that? Love to talk about this. What are the advantages and disadvantages of expected values? This is a very common question, especially the disadvantages. That one is a favorite question. Advantage uses the concept of probability, which is widely accepted approach in risk assessment. So this concept of probability is widely accepted in risk assessment. That is the, the advantage of this method. It's a widely, widely accepted approach. What are the problems? When there are too many outcomes, your analysis can become a bit complex. They are just add two. One, two, three. How do you assign probabilities? Assignment probabilities can be subjective, like the 0 0.1, 0 0.6, and 0 0.3 that we had. Where did these figures come from? Not good for one-off events. If we have one-off events, not good. Unless those events that are going to be undertaken repeatedly. Unless those that are going to be undertaken repeatedly. As an average, EV tends to hide extreme values. Just like any other average, isn't it? Just like any other average. Look at the, the question that you've just done. Look at the question that we've just done. In D, in D, there's one possibility. There's a possibility of getting a minus 20. But this did not come out in the total that we had. When we multiplied this, that, and that, and we added, there's no minus here, what we have is a positive. But there's a 30% chance, which is quite very big. There's a 30% chance of getting a negative. But it doesn't come out in this analysis. Mm -hmm. So that is the, so these advantages and disadvantages are quite common in the exam, especially the disadvantages of using the expected values or the EVs. So that's quite a common idea. For instance, let me just share a paper here to show how this was examined in one of the settings. Let's just check how this was examined in one of the settings. Huh? Here is a question. This was in 2016. There was a question there which says, 34, calculate the expected return on capital employment and assess the use of this tool for decision making. 
Now, in, in APM, it's very important that we learn how to read the questions and read them correctly. It says calculate the expected return on capital employed. So there's a computation here. So the examiner expects us to do a computation. So there's a computation here, which is coming here. An EV. And an assessment of the use of these two in decision making. Now, for us to get all these eight marks here, we need to make sure that you have done a correct computation, but also we have done a correct assessment of the method. Now, the information in the paragraphs or in the exhibits now, clearly explain what is expected. So the information in the exhibit gives further clarification, gives further clarification. So let us just check in the related paragraph to see really what he was further mentioned. And sometimes that's how we miss the eight marks. Let's look at what was mentioned. Here we are. As a company is opening many, many new stores, the board also wants an assessment of the use of expected return on expected return on capital employed as a tool for deciding new stores opening, illustrating this using data in appendix two. The focus of comments should be on the use of the expected values. Have you noticed? The use of expected values, and they are very clear, not on the use of return on capital employed. Reason, as this is widely used and understood in the retail industry. So the question I wanted you just to mention on the expected values. Those advantages and disadvantages that we have discussed. And also commenting whether this approach was suitable here. That's what was expected from you. So if uh, you do a computation, then you comment on the advantages and disadvantages. Well, you get your eight out of eight, or if the marker was stingy, you still get your seven out of eight. Provided you've done both, you've done your computation, and also you've clearly done your assessment of the EV method. These two items in line with the, the requirement of the question. Okay, so that was um, an item I wanted to share with you from the past exam and also the concept of risk and the uncertainty in decision making and in performance management. Let's just check our program, what it says now. Let's check what our program says. Yeah, it's 12.30 now. So we take a lunch break and we're back at 13.30 for additional material coverage. So after our lunch break, we move on now to other aspects, want to move into business structures and also want to move into the concept of budgeting. So those are the items that we'll be dealing with after lunch. So please enjoy your lunch and let's uh, log back at 1.30 and we continue with our work. Is that okay for everybody? Yes. All right.